I'm Jane Hirschfield. We're here at the Botanical Garden at the very end of an exhibit of uh, Japanese autumn gardens with poems that I co-translated and chose for this occasion. I'm also a poet and an essayist uh, of my own work, not, not, not just a translator. And I'm going to be reading today poems both from ancient Japanese poets from many centuries and also then my own work which draws uh, on the imagery and themes that, that Autumn presents to us, uh, showing us certain parts of our own lives. Well, I would like to um, thank uh, the Botanical Garden, the Poetry Society of America, and Gail and Alice in particular for the chance. This is the first time I've ever got to curate poems in a botanical garden. And it's, it was just completely exciting for me to uh, go through my entire library of uh, Japanese literature to try to figure out which poems might suit such an exhibit. I still haven't seen the exhibit. Alice and I are going to look at it uh, after this reading, so maybe I will see you all there. I was asked for this uh, reading part of the event to read both from the Japanese translations and from my own work. So I'm going to start with the Japanese and then however many of my own poems there's time for. It, it turns out I have a great deal more autumnal poetry than I had even realized when I went to pick and choose what to, what to bring with me. Um, is, is the volume okay? Can you all hear all right? Yes? Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Japanese poems. Some of them are in the exhibit, a few of them aren't. Um, and they're a little bit randomly in order, but I did think I would begin with three poems that do refer to chrysanthemums. Uh, the chrysanthemum is a very interesting flower in Japanese culture in that you, you, you hear a great deal about the plum and the cherry, which are the spring flowers uh, which pass very quickly. And one of the great debates throughout Japanese literature, you will find um, uh, debates, which is the more poignant and beautiful season, spring or autumn? And it's the kind of thing that when you were falling in love with someone, you would, you would stay up all night discussing whether spring or autumn was the more poignant and beautiful of the seasons. And summer and winter were just not contenders at all, uh, you know, boring. But the, the tension here is with the question of transience. Um, a great deal of beauty and grief must balance um, in our lives. Each tempers the other and makes the other sharper and more perceptible. If you're merely happy with no realization somewhere under your skin that it's momentary and will pass, your happiness might be trivial. If you are only sad with no realization of the extraordinariness of this very moment and the beauty even of sorrow, you will perhaps fall into despair. And so that tension is in almost all of these Japanese poems, and probably I could make a case for all Western poems as well that I'm going to read you. So to come back to the chrysanthemum, um, what's interesting is the flowers of spring, when you're on your way into the long luxury of summer, they pass very quickly. Uh, the reason that the plum supplanted the cherry in Japanese poetry is because it falls even faster. Uh, the chrysanthemum is the opposite. As you are moving towards the rigorous iciness of winter, the poignance of the chrysanthemum is that it actually does last a while. And it is, in a way, an emblem of transience because it's an autumn flower, but also a defiance of transience because it lasts. And the other thing about chrysanthemums is in Buddhist Japanese iconography, 
Um, think of a chrysanthemum. Just imagine a chrysanthemum if, if you haven't already been looking at them for, for the last hour or two. And the explosion of beauty in every direction coupled with stillness becomes a kind of figure for the conditioned of awakened mind. And so very often a chrysanthemum uh, is the, the um, reminder of the uh, spotless open heart of Buddhist awakening. So here are three chrysanthemum poems. Uh, the first two are by Busan, an 18th century haiku poet, so the shorter form, only three lines. This white chrysanthemum, for a moment before it, the scissors pause. You know, someone's going out to cut their prized chrysanthemum, and it's so beautiful they can't bear to cut it. And one of the glories of this poem is you don't even see the person. It's as if the objective scissors themselves hesitate and stay the hand which we know is holding them but isn't mentioned in the poem. Uh, the second one by Busan, I think this one is not in the exhibit. Uh, no, it's the third one that isn't, this is. The lanterns lit, the color of yellow chrysanthemums disappears. So daylight has faded, a lantern is lit, and in that yellow light of evening's lantern, the yellow of the chrysanthemum vanishes back into the seeing of, of night vision. Uh, this third poem, the poet is most famous for this poem. Imagine perhaps a tea ceremony, or in any case, two people sitting in a room where the chrysanthemum is in the formal altar niche of, of the room, and probably very little else is in it. No words, host, guest, the white chrysanthemum. Well, I think Japanese poetry is an amazingly good entrance gate into reading poems because they are both short and they use the universal imagery of the natural world to talk about time, love, beauty, transience, loss, connection, and they're a very good entrance gate. So I, I recommend almost almost any anthology of Japanese literature, or you could start with the one that I've done of two women from a thousand years ago, a book called The Ink Dark Moon. Okay, the next several poems I will read you are the earlier Tonka form. It's 31 syllables instead of 17. And the difference between these two forms, 14 syllables might seem very little to an English language poet, but it creates extraordinarily different poems. Um, haiku give you a momentary flash of experience. Tonka, you can almost always intuit an entire narrative story behind them. When you learn how to read them, uh, you, you can figure out what life circumstance are they alluding to. Uh, so the first two by different poets are almost the same poem in different images. So Princess Shikishi in the 12th century these mosses and ferns still keep their deepest green, but within them, autumn insects have made an inn. The second poem, earlier, Onono Komachi, 9th century. Tokiwa Mountain's pine trees are always green. I wonder, do they recognize autumn in the sound of the blowing wind? And both of these poems are, as is always the case with Japanese poetry and Western poetry, I do not ever want to dismiss that they are about exactly what they describe and nothing more. It's very important to keep primary the original images. It is about mosses and ferns and autumn insects. It is about pine trees and greenness. but. It is also, since many of these poems were used as ways to figure out one's life, to feel one's life, to understand one's life, and also very often as communication sent between lovers, um, both these poems, I think, are probably about the question of the lastingness of a relationship. 
Tokiwa Mountain is commonly associated with lovers. Uh, the fullness of a green time, a green relationship, unchanging pine trees. But then this question, does autumn happen anyhow? Is there a hidden ending resident in what seems to be outside of time? That is something many lovers have asked themselves over the centuries. And one can also take another interpretation yet about simply the fullness of anything, not necessarily about eros and love. Uh, this next poem is certainly a lover's poem. O oh, spider lily that grows on the mountain called waiting, is there someone you also promised to meet this autumn? That one's practically flirtatious. There's lots of different moods in, in these. these uh, this is also Ono no Komachi. Uh, and and uh, it, it is a poem of invitation. You would have sent that to somebody to let them know you were waiting. Uh, this next one, again Komachi, very different in feeling. This pine tree by the rock must have its memories too. After a thousand years, see how its branches lean toward the ground. And the entire poignance of the poem rests on one syllable in English, one syllable in Japanese, that word to, which is saying, I look at this pine tree and I see my own life just this momentary flash that opens the poem up for you and lets you show that in Komachi's heart, she feels the weight and pull of her own life and its circumstances as much as a tree that is leaning in that way shows a thousand years of wind, a thousand years of gravity that, that cause it this great beauty and you know, this is something I often think about. In our Western culture, where, where the young are beautiful and the old are uh, so often not beautiful, in trees, we really prefer the older ones. They have character. They, have, they show the signal of time uh, encompassed. A sapling. What's a sapling compared to this ancient leaning pine tree? Um, so now we have again Tokiwa Mountain, the same place with the evergreen pine trees associated with lovers uh, by a slightly later Japanese woman poet, Izumi Shikibu. When the autumn wind blows down from Tokiwa Mountain, my body fills as if blushing with the color and scent of pine. You can feel the fillness, fullness of that. Um, Back to some haiku. Uh, these are all by Basho. Um, I'm not going to give you his life story, but he's pretty much considered the founder of the haiku form as a serious art form. And uh, that whole 99 cent uh, ebook, uh, The Heart of Haiku, uh, Amazon retitled it, and, and they chose that title. It's, it's pretty much about Basho and about haiku, seen through Basho, um, rather than about haiku in general. Um, this road through autumn nightfall, no one walks it. This road through autumn nightfall, no one walks it. He is almost disappearing into the world with that poem. Uh, that's a late poem of his. This is an early one. This is the one that kind of made his name as a haiku poet. It's considered the first one where he came into his own voice. On a leafless branch, a crow's settling, autumn nightfall. One of the things which is radical about that poem is Japanese poetry before Basha wouldn't have a crow in it. A crow is an unpoetic bird. It's black. It caws roughly. And one of the things that was happening when Basho brought haiku forward as an art form was he was including regular life. He was expanding the diction of what could come into poetry. And this has happened in different versions. You know, Frank O'Hara did the same thing. Before him, Walt Whitman did the same thing. 
I mean, one of the ways you can look at the history of the world is this an ever-growing um, embrace of more and more aspects of life are included in what is considered poetic. Um, this one again, ordinary life, uh, biting into, being bitten into, radish sharp autumn wind. So think of a daikon, um, pretty ordinary little vegetable. Uh, this one, late chrysanthemum fragrance in the garden the worn-out sole of a shoe. And again, just a tiny bit of biography, um, Basho walked. He walked thousands of miles in his life, keeping poetic diaries as he did. He's home now. He's back in his hut. That worn-out sandal sole uh, went a long ways with him. And you can think of the almost acrid scent of a chrysanthemum Again, not, not a lovely fragrance, a sharp fragrance. And he's seeing the likeness between an old shoe sole. I'm quite sure there has never been an old shoe sole in Japanese poetry before this one. Uh, the name Basho uh, refers to, it's a pen name. It's about a banana plant, great big wide leaves, famously fragile, which of course, now that you're, if you weren't already aware, um, that, that Japanese poetry is always about transience, always about seeing this moment's glory and seeing its disappearance. Um, I just love this poem because it puts me right in his hut. I have a hypothesis that probably no one agrees with that whenever Basho is writing about the banana plant, he's writing about himself, since it is his pen name. Banana leaves torn by storm winds Rain dripping into an iron tub. A listening night. That was the biggest typhoon in a hundred years. That was the Hurricane Sandy of his lifetime, that particular storm. So, so one thing I'm really grateful for is that the Botanical Garden is putting poems out in the world, in front of people who aren't necessarily going to walk into a bookstore and go to the poetry shelf and open it up. So someone can be coming here to enjoy the day, enjoy being in the outside world, enjoy looking at plants, and suddenly fall over poetry. And it only takes a second to read a short poem on a big placard. And they might discover a new way of seeing the world, just like Seeing a pine tree teaches you something about longevity and greenness and abidingness. Uh, seeing a poem can teach you something about how you lead your life and how you feel your life. Uh, this next poem appears in a series of poems that open one of his diaries, and they're all very explicitly about transience. The first two are heartrendingly serious about seeing um, a skeleton by lying by the side of the road as he, as he started off on his journey. Uh, this is the third one in which he takes transience and looks at it a little differently. The roadside blooming mallow, eaten by my horse. Late in his life, Basho got very depressed he was spending all of his time judging things, talking to people, socializing. He was caught up in the, uh, the, the New York City social world of, of Tokyo in his time. And he just felt like he'd lost himself. In a poem which isn't particularly an autumn poem, he describes himself as a monkey's face wearing a monkey's mask. It's a very bitter poem. And he decided he had to do something about this. And he locked himself in his hut to try to figure it out. And at the end, he came out with a new aesthetic, a new idea, which he called lightness, Kurumi. And this is a poem expressing that very act of retreat, but in an image vocabulary of lightness. Morning glory, a day flowering lock bolts my gate. So he hadn't opened his gate for so long that a morning glory vine grew across it. Back to a tonka now, the longer form, uh, a 13th century poet, Fujiwara Noteka. 
Look past vanished blossoms, past red fallen leaves. A thatched hut stands near an inlet, swallowed by autumn dusk. That poem just takes you deeper and deeper and deeper into autumn. Uh, a poem by a 12th century priest, Jacqueline. A loneliness no nameable color or beauty can hold. Over the dark pine mountains, dusk deepens on far autumn hills. Saigyo, another priest who um, had a great tension in his life between whether or not he should experience the normal human passions. This is a poem about that. Even the heart of a person free of passions would feel this as sorrow. Autumn evening, one snipe rising out of the marsh grass. There was a later poet, Shiki, 19th century, who brings haiku into a more modern vocabulary yet. His poems have a little different feeling about them. I'll read you two of his. One is in the exhibit, one isn't. Uh, the one that isn't, so he had uh, tuberculosis from childhood. He wanted to be a baseball player. And uh, he was too sick and he couldn't be a baseball player. Instead, he became a great poet. And uh, this gave him Japan being Japan, uh, the singular honor of being the only poet who has ever been inducted into a baseball hall of fame, which Shiki was. Um, so, and he also, he kept some of uh, Basho's feeling of uh, confront the worst with lightness. Uh, so my obituary, let it read, loved poems, eight persimmons. And then this other deeply, deeply intimate one. In blowing autumn winds, alive, looking at one another, you, I. There's something about that poem which just undoes me. It is such a recognition of, my God, we're still alive. No matter what is around us, no matter what we're feeling, we are here, we are together, we are looking at one another, and what a miracle that is. Um, Isa, uh, 18th century haiku poet. Moon, flowers, between you for 49 years, I've walked nowhere. And two more by Basho, and then I'll move, move from Japanese poems to some of mine. Um, you know, the thing about interpreting Japanese poems is it is totally open. They usually are not left with instructions. And if you read, there's, there's a marvelous book that gives you the criticism of Japanese poet critics over the years, and they all contradict each other extraordinarily about what they think the poems might be referring to. And they all do do this equation business of what's the story behind it, what's the circumstance behind it. Um, uh, it's, it seems to be how, how the poems are supposed to be read in their home culture. Um, so this poem by Basho can either be incredibly poignant uh, if you take it at its surface value, or it can be pretty funny if you bring a certain interpretation to it. Deep into fall, this caterpillar, still a caterpillar. So you, you hear both, you know, the point is, if it's actually a caterpillar, this is tragic. You know, it never got to be. But if it's him reflecting on himself, you know, here I am at the end of my life and I'm still a totally unformed person, then it becomes very funny and rueful and, and modest and sweet. And I have no idea. You know, the thing about reading these poems, one mood you'll read them one way, another mood you'd, you'll read them another. And the last poem from very late in Basho's life when he was ill, um, a poem of social recognition. Deep Autumn, my neighbor, how is he? And this shows you, you know, the opposite of narcissism and solipsism. I mean, here he is, he's ill, he could be feeling sorry for himself. And instead, he says, 
you know, it is so cold, it is so dark, life is almost ending, how's my neighbor doing? Um, beautiful poems. Okay, so it's really hard to follow great dead poets with one's own work. Um, it, it, you know, it's like, what can one do? So just take a breath um, and, and prepare to hear different rhythms, different moods, less, less distilled compression. Um, I, I write short poems, but they're really wordy compared to Japanese poems. My, my own poetry books, the most recent is a book called Come Thief. Uh, before that, one called After, one called Given Sugar, Given Salt. And all of my poems have been influenced by these Japanese poems that I've loved so much since I was a very young child. They try to look at the objects and lives of the outer world, its mountains and trees, as well as its human beings and its fishes and its birds, and to find from that looking around oneself, not only the actual world we're so lucky to be part of, but also the inner world, which we know from looking at not only ourselves, but at the, at the great wideness and vastness of existence. Um, so I thought I'd start with a very simple leaf. Large as two hands together, still cupping rain, yellow of amber stripped lightless, scent of cold leather. Nameless, one of 10,000 lifted without complaint or hope to this painted table, neither envelope nor letter, almost nothing. Yet before you, words lie down in envy and silence, switch their tails, bury their damp, dark snouts between paws. Uh, this one is a sort of tie-in poem in that it refers to uh, Japan. Leaving the October Palace. In ancient Japan, to travel meant always away. Towards the capital, one spoke only of return. As these falling needles and leaves speak of return, their long labors of green tired finally into gold, the desire that remembered them into place, prepared at last to let go. Though not for want of faithfulness, all that once followed the sun still follows it now as it turns away. The courtiers assemble their carriages, fold up their robes. By daybreak, the soundless mountains bow under snow. These are pretty early poems for me. They're from the 90s, uh, th those first two. I mean, I'm reading from all over the map of time. And uh, um, this one's a little more recent. It's from 2001. I didn't know if today was going to be a hot day or a cold day. Um, so this is for one of those very hot autumn days, the heat of autumn. The heat of autumn is different from the heat of summer. One ripens apples. The other turns them to cider. One is a dock you walk out on, the other the spine of a thin swimming horse, and the river each day a full measure colder. A man with cancer leaves his wife for his lover. Before he goes, she straightens his belts in the closet, rearranges the socks and sweaters inside the dresser by color. That's autumn heat her hand placing silver buckle with silver, gold buckles with gold, setting each on the hook it belongs on in a closet soon to be empty and calling it pleasure. Kind of a complicated, uh, but we've known people like that. We've known breakups like that. Uh, very short uh, one autumn. Again, the wind flakes gold leaf from the trees, and the painting darkens, as if a thousand penitents kissed an icon till it thinned back to bare wood without diminishment. It's a rhyming poem. 
um, penitence and diminishment. I tend to stretch my rhymes. This one even shorter, and a long time ago, this was picked to uh, ride around on the New York subway system, which I thought was pretty funny. I thought, what is this, you know, uh, erotic poem about a rural garden mine um, doing on the subways, um, but it was short. It fit the placard nicely. I loved being on the subways. Anytime, Alice, <laughs> anytime. <laughs> the ground fall pear. It is the one he chooses, yellow, plump, a little bruised on one side from falling. That place he takes first. Any woman of a certain age will love that poem. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything. A lot of these are so old. Um, this one, I was looking out the window one day. I was on the East Coast writing in a little cabin at McDowell. And you know how sometimes there's this sort of dusty leaf litter of brown, tiny, tiny bits falling down. And, and I just sort of looked at him, what, what, what is that? You know, it was as if someone was throwing confetti outside the window. It must be leaves. Too slow for rain, too large for tears, and grief cannot be seen. It must be leaves, but broken ones, and brown, not green. So, you know, the thing about using seasons in poems is Western poetry is not that different than Japanese poetry. Anything you describe in the out, outer world, once it's in a poem, is also the inner world. Um, so weathers, events, gardens. And one of the things that practicing poetry does is make more alive everything you see as it steps forward to do the extra work of saturating yourself in your life and in the world a little more fully. So this again, a quite early poem. I wanted to read one poem that it actually makes me very sad because it was a poem written in 1983 um, occasioned by a tiny little newspaper article about our invasion of Grenada, which most people don't even you know, remember ever happened. And all that time ago, when I was, you know, that much younger, just my, my grief of the continual state of war that we seem always to be in at one level or another, and we still are, so I thought I'd read this today. October 20th, 1983. On a quiet morning in autumn, I read the ledgers of a war, as one can any day, any list biased, dishonest, incomplete, and still the numbers are kept. It is true the papyrus wears thin after 40 centuries. For the winter garden, roses are pruned and carefully tied, earth banked up over the roots. What if after Antigone, the moment of catharsis, we quarrel in the car going home? If compassion cannot cure us, what if we fail? I look at my hands, my fingernails still black with chosen labors. I know that tomorrow I will go out again to mulch, to bind, to clip, and that no order imposed is free of guilt. The line from a Greek chorus, sing sorrow, sorrow, but good win out in the end. But who is measuring? What heart would choose this tune? And then another way of looking at uh, the unstoppable train of sorrow and grief and loss and vanishment, ripeness. Ripeness is what falls away with ease. Not only the heavy apple, the pear, but also the dried brown strands of autumn iris from their corm. 
to let your body love this world that gave itself to your care in all of its ripeness with ease and will take itself from you in equal ripeness and ease is also harvest. And however sharply you are tested, this sorrow, that great love, it too will leave on that clean knife. So I'm trying to figure out just a few more. Let me look at what I've got. Let's see. Oh, skipping so many. Okay, th three more. Um, this is a very early poem. It was my third published poem, and you can imagine how happy I was when long, long ago Howard Moss took it for The New Yorker. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever written. I put it in an envelope all by itself, and darned if he didn't agree. Um, <laughs> November Remembering Voltaire. In the evenings, I scrape my fingernails clean, hunt through old catalogs for new seed, oil, work boots, and shears. This garden is no metaphor, more a task that swallows you into itself, earth using, as always, everything it can. I lend myself to unpromising winter dirt with leaf mold and bulb, plant into the oncoming cold. Not that I ever thought the philosopher meant to be taken literally, but with no invented god overhead, I conjure a stubborn faith in rotting that ripens into soil, in an old corm that rises steadily each spring. Not symbols, but reassurances, like a mother's voice at bedtime reading a long familiar book, the known words barely listened to, but joining for all the nights of a life, each world to the next. Uh, this poem is one of the reasons I ended up as the poet in residence at a neuroscience department. Um, it's about visiting a friend with Alzheimer's late in his life. The friend was an extraordinarily wonderful poet who wouldn't mind my naming him because he was perfectly public about his own condition from, from the early diagnosis. Uh, it was uh, Leonard Nathan. He was the chair of department at Rhetoric and really a spectacular poet. His last three books, all of quite, quite short but emotionally and imagistically sharp and complex and beautiful poems were all published by a little press called Archises Press, and I recommend them if you can find them. Um, he was also one of the best educated people I've ever known, and uh, everything I attribute to him here is, is accurate, and the quote is, is himself, uh, the pair. November, one pair sways on the tree past leaves, past reason. In the nursing home, my friend has fallen, chased, he said, from the freckled woods by angry Thoreau, Coleridge, and Beaumarchais. Delusion, too, it seems, can be well read. He is courteous, well-spoken even in dread. The old fineness in him hangs on for dear life. My mind now a small ship under the wake of a large. They force you to walk on your heels here. The angles matter four or five degrees, and you're lost. Life is dear to him yet. Though he believes it his own fault, he grieves. His own fault, his old friends have turned against him like crows against an injured of their kind. There is no kindness here, no flint of mercy. Descend, descend, some voice must urge inside the pear stem. The argument goes on, he cannot outrun it. Dawnlight to dawnlight I look, the pear still there. And the last poem, um, 
an autumn poem in every sense, including the way in Japanese poetry it is so often the signal for the end of life. Um, spell to be said upon departure. What was come here to do having finished? Shelves of the water lie flat. Copper the leaves of the door sill, yellow and falling. Scarlet the bird that is singing. Vanished the labor, here walls are. Completed the asking. Loosing the birds, there is water. Having eaten the pears, having eaten the black figs, the white figs, eaten the apples, table be strewn, table be strewn with stems, table with peelings of grapefruit and pleasure, table be strewn with pleasure, what was here to be done, having finished. Thank you very much. So, so thank you very much for uh, joining us on the website and coming to this program, which you might not have been able to be in person at, but you can experience the whole thing on your computer in your own time. It's an amazing world.